Hello, my name is Laura Murray. I'm a forester at Winrock International, a non-governmental organization based in the United States. As the co-developer of Module 2.5 on estimating carbon emissions and removals from deforestation and degradation, I am delighted to deliver this lecture as part of the Goffsey Gold World Bank FCPF training materials on red, sorry, monitoring and reporting. Before proceeding, I'll note that the topics covered in this module are built upon the key concepts and lessons covered in previous modules in this series, as well as Goffsey Gold source book. So it's recommended that you familiarize yourself with those materials before proceeding. We'll begin by exploring the General Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, framework for estimating emissions and removals. Then we'll learn about combining emission factors or removal factors with activity data to understand the emissions impacts of land use change activities. And finally, we'll conclude with country examples from Guyana and Indonesia. The Kyoto Protocol enacted in 1992 requires that all UN Annex 1 countries report anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions on an annual basis and encourages Annex 2 countries to do the same. The IPCC was then invited to provide standard methods and best practices for estimating emissions from land use within national greenhouse gas inventories. So they developed the 2003 Good Practice Guidelines for Land Use, Land Use Change in Forestry, commonly referred to as the GPG LULU CF. These guidelines did not cover emissions from the agricultural sector, however, so in 2006, the Agriculture, Forestry, and Other Land Use, or AFALU, guidelines were introduced. The AFALU guidelines serve as the basis for international estimation of emissions and removals from land use. They identify six land use categories and offer standard guidance on how to estimate emissions or removals resulting in changes in land use. The AFALU guidelines are formulated based on the principle that emissions must be reported based on changes in land use categories and that emissions represent the sum of carbon stock changes within each land use category. The six main land use categories include forest land, cropland, wetlands, grassland, settlements, and other land. Within each of these categories, there are subcategories. For example, forest land may be comprised of additional subcategories like uh, moist lowland forest or gallery forest. Maintaining these consistent land use categories allows nations to track land use changes over time in a consistent and comparable manner. The original GPG LULU CF guidelines delineate two subcategories that are relevant to RED. Land remaining in the same land use category and land converted to another land use. Of course, in the context of RED, that is forest land remaining forest land, which is where degradation occurs, and forest land converted to another land use, which is de deforestation. So to estimate emissions resulting from land use change conversions, as well as land use, one must develop emission factors with activity data corresponding to the predefined land use or land use conversion. As mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, it's recommended that practitioners are already familiar with the key concepts behind activity data and emission factors uh, for deforestation and degradation according to IPCC guidelines. But as a quick review, um, I'll go over these concepts. Activity data are a measure of the extent of land cover transition. This can either be described um, in terms of spatial extent in some cases, or in other cases could be um, units of production like timber volumes. Emission factors are a measure of the emissions or removals per unit of activity data. One then multiplies emission factors by their corresponding activity data to get the emissions from change, which is um, reported in tons of carbon dioxide. To develop activity data for deforestation, land cover maps from multiple points in time are compared to track the total area of change from forest to each other land use category. <clears throat> 
Emission factors require that carbon stocks for each land use category or subcategory are estimated through field data analysis. These emission factors for deforestation um, are generated by subtracting the post-deforestation land use carbon stocks from the forest carbon stocks to get the net carbon impact from land use change. Activity data are then, of course, combined with the emission factors to get net emissions, as is shown in this example of conversion of forest to cropland. For forest degradation, a number of approaches have been developed to quantify emissions for specific degradation activity types. Module 2.3 focuses on estimating emissions from forest degradation from selective timber harvesting, which involves combining data on the volume of timber removed, which serves as activity data, with an emission factor that is an estimate of the carbon impact uh, selective logging has on a forest. Net emissions from selective logging, representing the emissions as well as the carbon regained through growth following selective logging and wood stored in long-term wood products, can be calculated by subtracting the losses from gains as shown here. Of course, please see Module 2.3 for further guidance. As a practical example of for estimating emissions from deforestation, we'll now explore the methods that were applied in Guyana's monitoring uh, system for RED. Guyana applies a stock change approach for estimating emissions from deforestation. A benchmark map was developed, establishing a point of reference against which future changes could be compared. This benchmark map represents the first point in the time series that will eventually be sewn together to form an average deforestation rate or trend describing the rate of historic emissions to contribute to the combined reference level that covered all of Guyana's reference uh, red activities. Using remote sensing, a second map was then developed five years after the benchmark map, and losses over that time period were quantified in hectares and then, of course, multiplied by their corresponding emission factors. The summed emissions then represented the second point in the time series, or time two, and this process was repeated for several additional time periods to form a trend of historical emissions from deforestation. This slide has details on the forest strata divided according to accessibility in Guyana's case, and then subdivided by deforestation driver. <clears throat> Activity data for each stratum were then multiplied by their corresponding emission factor to get the total emissions per forest stratum for, in this case, the 2010 to 2011 time period. The next example I'll go over is estimating emissions from degradation caused by selective logging in East Kalimantan, Indonesia. Here, a gain-loss approach was applied whereby both carbon losses as well as gains are considered. Losses are calculated by combining data on timber volume extracted with the estimated carbon losses experienced through incidental damage and infrastructure establishment associated with selective logging. Carbon gains are potential forest regrowth, and the wood that gets stored in eventual wood products like furniture was also accounted for, which ultimately, of course, decreases the final magnitude of carbon losses. This slide shows the calculation approach which is, was shown briefly earlier on in this module. Um, so I'll go ahead and move on to the next slide. Again, module 2.3 goes over this approach in much more detail. So here are the numbers for the um, work in, or for, for the degradation, um, for the de estimation of emissions from degradation in East Kalimantan. Um, <clears throat> 
Field work was conducted to estimate the emission factor, um, which corresponds to each cubic meter of timber extracted. The emission factor included carbon emissions from the extracted log, the incidental damage from the felling of the tree, as well as the bits of tree left over after extraction, like the crown and the roots, as well as the infrastructure um, established, like roads and log landings. Under this approach, emissions were assumed to be committed. That is, they occur at the time of the event, rather than calculating the carbon dioxide emissions that happen gradually over the, the course of tree decomposition. Um, this committed approach was done uh, to simplify the calculation of emissions. Here we see the actual numbers for each component of the emission factor, as well as the activity data, which were combined, of course, to produce an estimate of total emissions in tons of carbon dioxide per year. Gains were calculated as an estimate of how much timber is stored in long-term products, um, as well as the um, estimated rates of regrowth in logging gaps. For long-term products, it's assumed that the final wood products that the timber would end up as were sawn wood and wood panels. Then, a methodology was applied that accounts for the key losses in timber volume that happened during the processing phase, like milling, um, as well as how much the timber goes into the short and long-term products. Regrowth was estimated um, from combining the, an estimate of the total area of logging gaps based on field measurements with a regrowth rate that was derived from literature. Finally, net emissions were calculated by combining the estimate of total gains with losses in tons of carbon dioxide per year. So that concludes this lecture. Um, in summary, this module provided guidance on estimating carbon emissions from deforestation and degradation following IPCC guidelines and land use classifications. The overarching approach for estimating carbon emissions and removals by combining activity data and emission factors was discussed, partly through a review of topics and concepts covered in previous modules offered in this training series. I also provided some examples demonstrating a stock change approach for estimating emissions from deforestation, as well as a gain loss approach for estimating um, emissions from forest degradation. Thank you for listening to this lecture on uh, of module 2.5 of the Goffsey Gold World Bank FCPF training materials for red monitoring and reporting.